Hey everyone. My name is T. Tran Lee, and I'm so excited to have you here with us tonight. Um, I am the Senior Programs Coordinator at AAWW. For accessibility, you can find uh, access to the captions function at the bottom of your Zoom screen between Q&A and raise hand. And to access our ASL interpreters and make sure they're pinned, please find our pro bono ASL interpreters, Ingrid and Gregorio, pinning them to your screen. They will also be spot lit. A quick description of myself and my space. I am a Chinese, Vietnamese, American, agender person with big round glasses and very short black hair. I'm wearing a navy and white plaid tank top. I am speaking to you from Occupy the Napa Hoking, where we are grateful to past and present stewards of this land. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I know a lot of you are on the West Coast. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, please visit our website, AAWW, where you can sign up for our newsletter and find out all of the fun things we are doing this summer and for the rest of the year. Um, outside of being a programs coordinator at AAWW, I proudly serve as the shop steward for AAWW Union, founded in 2018. We are so happy to work with Ingrid and Gregorio of Pro Bono ASL for ASL interpretation this evening. Thank you both for providing accessibility to our events. Tonight, we are here to celebrate the interdisciplinary works and conversation from Filipinx poets, Christine Imperial, Jan Henry Gray, Jen Soriano, Angela Pena Redondondo, and Kate Ulandai Barrett. Tonight, we will witness the works of Christine, Jan Henry, Jen, Angela, and then the conversation afterward will be led by Kay. Let's get started. Our first reader of the evening is Christine Imperial. Christine Imperial is a PhD cultural studies student at UC Davis, where she was awarded the Dean's Distinguishing Graduate Fellowship. Her first book, Mistaken for an Empire, is published with Mad Creek Books, an imprint of the Ohio State University, as a 2021 Gurney Prize winner. She holds an MFA in creative writing from California Institute of the Arts. At CalArts, she was the 2020 Emmy Kuriyama thesis winner and 2020 to 2021 Reef Fellow. Her, her work has been published in Poets and Writers, Poetry, Inverted Syntax, TLD, TD, among others. Welcome, Christine. Yes, I'm so thankful to Angela for inviting me and being in space with all these incredible poets. Uh, before I read, I'm going to do an image description of myself. I'm Christine, a brown Filipino poet in a dark gray shirt with a, a green cover. Um, I have glasses on with gold rims, and I am uh, behind me is a predominantly white background. Um, so I'm going to be reading uh, an excerpt from my book, Mistaken for an Empire. Um, and I'm just I'm just gonna go read now. What delight emerges from the echo of our dissonance? Leave my breath suspended on the tether of a buoy. Allow me another jubilant scream before the whisper sows vines into the unintelligible, before the blooming a riot, before the riot a pause. How difficult to answer how something remains. In the dream, I walk from dirt field to dirt field to stumble onto dirt field. A crowd disperses at the sight of my arrival. A siren gestures to see. I find my head mid collision, the point in front of a shipping vessel, hungers for a new body, seeking escape. I learn what it means to turn away from. In the dream, I sing the separations of a text to speech machine. There must be a way out of here before the tendrils of violence. I'm trying again. Let's return to some sort of beginning. My mother gathers my hair and twist it into a bun, winding each strand in place. My scalp stretched. I try to look for traces of myself in the mirror, 
as she dabs as she dabs powder around swollen eyes. You look just like me. A cat eats her kittens. The child's head in her mouth. She understands survival as the faint cry of what was once welcomed. Bone against bone in broad daylight on subdivision sidewalk as fur splinters pallet. Young blood blossoms into a five-point star splayed across aging snout as skull smashes into teeth. The first response, an ad for prosthetic limbs, reattach the broken pieces with gold, create surface. My mother inserts herself into the image of my siblings on a beach in the Philippines, zoomed in face beside portrait taken on steel sand. In a gallery, pyramids of foil jut out from the black canvas, car cutting my body into my mother, where is a kaleidoscope of clothes my sister and I forget in her room. The foil carves each limb into triangulations. Behold, this bleeding, this splintered palette. My fingers count the squares on a map, on a map of the world to locate a time zone. From the prime meridian, hours apart, I wander through the garden to stomp on what Lala calls shy plants, to watch dark green petals clasp into each other, forming someone grabs my hand in the dark, a response, the flinch, the body pulling away from. My mother tries to hold me while I sleep, curled up against the beige walls of her bedroom as I count the squares toward the Philippines. I step on plants. I type NA on an information sheet. At a family dinner, Lolo reaches into his mouth to pull out false teeth, a formation, webs of saliva as frayed blue gums smile. My mother tells me to stop crying. She leaves, responds to memory. I'm cutting it up, pasting it onto. I count enough toward California. The channels change all at once. Barbara Walters reports the news while a clip of a tiger resting on a smiling cowboy's shoulder plays on. I write desire paths on my palm. What appears, a survey of the Southern California landscape displayed on a billboard. An infant grips onto a finger. I peel bark off narrow trees. My sister and I carve faces out from family photos. Excited fingers misshaping the round surfaces of heads into rocky mountain paths. Glue oozes from the in-between of my sister's face, imposed on a wedding dress. A figure in gaudy floral print as my enlarged, my enlarged toddler head cradles my infant brother. We're laughing, passing it around. We cover our mother's face. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think... Jan is next and it's very exciting. So. Hi everyone. Thank you so, so much, Christine. That was amazing. Please everyone join me in a round of applause. Um, and yes, next we are so excited to introduce Jan Henry Gray. Um, Jan Henry Gray is the author of Documents, selected by D.A. Powell as the winner A. Pullen Junior Poetry Prize and the chapbook selected emails from Spect Books. He's received fellowships from Kundiman, Undaki Poets, and the Cook Foundation. He was born in the Philippines and has lived in San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, and Brooklyn. He is the assistant professor at Adelphi University in New York. Please everyone give a warm welcome to Jan Henry Gray. Hi, there were so many buttons to pay attention to. I forgot the unmute one. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, thank you to our interpreters. Thank you to our hosts. Um, Angela, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to, oh, image description. I'm a brown queer man in a room with moving boxes and some random plants and a few post-its and a few books behind me. Um, I'm wearing a yellow t-shirt with a grid on it. Um, um, I'm gonna read some, I'm gonna read four poems. Uh, I'm reading two poems from documents um, and then two new poems for what I'm now calling the next book. Um, and I've already lost my page. Okay, this is called a missing document. 
February 1984, Quezon City, Philippines. Documents, copies of I-94, missing. Supporting information, flight number, date of departure, seat numbers of the family, missing. Tell the story of somewhere else, ISBN 978-1566891730. I had a taste for ambiguity and arrival. ISBN 9781561814080. Her hand did not wave. Her hand was ice, ice set to the temperature of the air. The air between the sand pressed to make the glass. The glass window she stood behind next to the door the wood door, the heavy wood door that I can't say for sure it was oak, but I'm certain was heavy, oiled, ridged, with a gold doorknob that looked like what we were told gold looked like. Gold, the color, not the ore, not AU or dollar sign or what fills the vaults in the movies my mother's father watches on a Sunday. Awake in the 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m. dark, his cigarette burning. It's a kind of dying orange sunrise light. Her hand, her hand against the glass, my mother's sister's hands, or maybe they were Maya Darren's hands. Something's getting in the way. Can't say for sure. My mother's name is Rebecca. Focus. Tell us about her hand. What do you see? ground us in the work, the details, go there, really take us somewhere. This is called birth certificate. The pot boils. I reach deep into the oven and scar the scarred part of my arm. I place words and words together, untogether, take apart to make an art from documents that twin a life to mine. It was 1984, it was 1987, it was 1997, it's 2023, I was 21, I was 18, I was six, he was 13, I was born, I was six. It's been 32, 37, 38, I'm 45 years old, it's been 39 years of verses and few refrains. Um, I'm going to read two new poems that are um, these uh, table poems. I'm just going to just really briefly say that it's in a very collage-like condensed form that I invented as a way of tricking myself into writing poems. Here they are. The first one's called On Our Backs Looking Up. Large cockroach dead from poison, looking up at the ceiling, packing lightly, Imagining the late train home, thank you note, touching the pale of your forearm with my fingers, feeling beautiful, breathing together, a banana spotting black, last night's unfinished wine in a green bottle, the face of the light fixture, checking your skin in the mirror, checking your bank account, our clothes stuffed into one piece of luggage. In hotel beds, two windows facing south, ghosts of last night's feast, the smell of rot from the soil. On your floor, there is protocol and survival, torn foil, an entire body slackening, exhaling. Do you know the way back? The licked spoon on the counter, the wet doorknob where hands have touched. One of us is sleeping, one of us is listening to the other one snore. The long way there, the quick boomerang back. The monstera with the brown tips, the cactus with its itinerant cycles of bloom. What if the apps fail? What if the map misdirects? Before the surgery, time turns soft, cracked glass casserole dish forgotten in the freezer, two lovers fighting in silence in the restaurant window for all to witness. For years, through tears, no one takes a picture over a coffin, oh, to be young, 
and to be that now with some hope for something else, something new, with what we saw in that kitchen that morning, us on our backs, us on our way. Thank you for listening. Um, this last one is called On Therapy. On Therapy. Say yes when anyone asks. It can happen all of a sudden without the writing on the wall. Some proof that the person is yearning, clawing for language, craving clarity with grace, with gratitude. Over time as a gift and not an exchange, health breeds health, ill-equipped therapy, not as a luxury, but as a practice daily glacial pace, incremental dissolution, uncanny estrangement, mirroring, mirroring. Maya says that all we have is time and we can only control how we make use of our time, our pleasure. This civilization is sunsetting. We discover and recover, pick a team or family. At sunrise, it's easier to go. It's easier to go it alone. The two body problem, the new lover's arms, the fragments, the pages without dates. You call everything you don't want to think about a distraction. Because love itself and the models of it have failed to walk away, to live without revision, to fix your own problems, to be unburdened by regret. The films are filled with the romance of heartbreak, a shock to the system, the dread of untangling your own logic in boxes, in books, in rhetoric, your ticks recorded in the pauses, your face refracted in the silverware. Who keeps what and why? Who knows to accept help, finding yourself in what you've written? The relationship has an end one that doesn't feel like one. Thank you. I'm sorry, everyone. I lost myself for a minute. Thank you so much. I didn't want to take away from Jan Harvey's amazing, amazing reading. Thank you, Jan, um, for sharing that with us, for sharing space with us, for sharing your presence with us. Thank you. Up next, we have Jen Soriano. Um, Jen Soriano, she, they, is the Philippinex writer and movement builder who has worked who has worked at the intersection of grassroots organizing, narrative strategy, and art-driven social change. Jen has won the International Literary Award for Creative Fiction and the Few Prose Prize and fellowships from Hugo House, Vermont Cent Studio Center, Artist Trust, and the Jack Jones Literary Retreat. Jen is also an independent scholar and performer, author of the chapbook Making the Tongue Dry, and co-editor of Closer to Liberation, a, P a P Penex a anthology originally from a landlocked part of the Chicago area. Jen now lives with her family in Seattle near Duwamish River and Salish Sea. Her debut essay collection, Nervous, will be published August 22nd, 2023 by Amistad Books. Give it up for Jen. Thank you, T. I am going to share my screen, but before I do that, I'll give a quick image description. I'm a light-skinned Filipinx non-binary femme with asymmetric hair, and I'm wearing a baseball cap with a colorful brim and long blue feather earrings, a blue tank top, and behind me are walls with activist art prints on them. So I'm going to share my screen because what I'm going to share with you all is an excerpt from my forthcoming book, Nervous, and it's from an essay called 381 Years um, that I wrote in the format originally of the Bible, <laughs> but then it evolved into a format that is what I think of as a visual representation of a balagdasan, 
which if you don't know what a balaktasan is, it was a verbal sparring match between two poets uh, that was uh, invented in Tondo, Manila, in, in the Philippines. All right, I will just dive in. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing, content content warning that uh, this reading contains descriptions, historical descriptions of war and mentions of violence and mass rape. 381 years. Colonization, the scramble to cut and consume bodies or dividing the map into slices of bitter imperial pie. Balagtasan, the clapbacks that remember our agency, or a head to toe anatomy of history that leads our bodies somewhere whole. Belly. Laughing saves the family, my aunt used to say. We have a lot of problems, and for every problem, we have a joke. My aunt knew in her gut what Freud had to write a book about to understand that jokes rescue pleasure that would otherwise be surrounded by suffering. When MacArthur returned to the Philippines in October 1944, his troops surrounded Manila to take back the capital. My uncle also understood that humor was a way to take back power and triumph over indignity. Though history celebrates this moment as the triumphant bookend to MacArthur's declaration, I shall return, it was more a moment of I shall blunder. MacArthur had cut off the Japanese escape route, prompting what would become one of the bloodiest battles of the Second World War. My uncle once waited all day in a line that surrounded the U.S. Embassy in Manila, but was rejected for a visa for the third time. His chances to go to America cut off, he started arguing with the embassy officials. Japanese soldiers behaved like cornered animals. They blew up factories and warehouses and took down power and water systems. Large hotels, including the Manila Hotel, became sites of organized mass rapes. Whole families were slaughtered, babies were bayoneted, pregnant women disemboweled. An embassy officer called my uncle a monkey, and so he began to behave like one. He yelled, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, and scratched his armpits. He waved his hands in the air, but the best was yet to come. This does not even count the American shellings and bombings that were to come. While the embassy officer watched my uncle's hands wave around, my uncle took advantage of the confusion to pop a heavy punch to the officer's jaw, then ran away. The 37th Infantry Division led most of the American combat in Manila, and it was known for being heavy handed with its artillery. This was part of their strategy of saving American lives. Our strategy, turn collateral damage into stew, transubstantiate the belly of the beast, reconstitute its tripa as the bomb dinaguan in Pinapaitan of rising again. Americans bombed the Philippine General Hospital, which housed more than 7,000 Filipino civilians, among other refugee centers that became collateral damage. This is how we gut the monster, clean its entrails, eat the belly from the inside out until there is nothing left of the beast. The American High Commissioner later admitted, we leveled entire cities with our bombs and shell fire. We destroyed roads, public buildings, and bridges. We raised sugar mills and factories. In the end, there was nothing left. The humor of the oppressed is raising something out of nothing, a peso out of 15 centavos, multiplying survival by the factor of a Benjamin. After the Battle of Manila, about 1,000 American soldiers died and at least 100,000 Manila residents were killed, many buried in unmarked graves. In the end, we can only touch into levity once we exhume ghosts from their unmarked graves. Total Filipino deaths across the archipelago over the course of the war totaled more than 1.6 million. For this, they also try to destroy not just our joy, but the glory of our grief. Historian Daniel Immerwar calls it by far the most destructive event ever to take place on US soil. 
So from the soil of our bellies, let there flow the groundwater of laughter intermingled with sobs. Our smiles will not be minstrel shows for the master. I think I'm actually going to end there. Thank you so, so much, Jen. That was amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing your screen with us as well. It was so wonderful to... I just love it. I, I love these virtual events because we have we have those options. Um, thank you so much. Our last reader before we get into these uh, before we get all of these beautiful minds together is Angela Pina Redondo. Angela Pina Redondo is a writer, artist, assistant professor of creative writing, and Pina Redondo is the author of Nature Felt but Never Apprehended from Naomi Press. All things lose thousands of times from Elandia Institute and winner of the Hillary Grandovic Regional Prize and the chapbook Maroon from Jamil Milley Publications. Their work has appeared in the Academy of American Poets, Pilates Magazine, Michigan Quarterly Review, Southern Humanities Review, and elsewhere. They received fellowships from Hedgebrook, Konyman, and Macondo, and rewards from Tin House, Community of Writers, and others. They are based in unceded lands of Tangvan, Serrano, and Tata Viam nations with their partner and many cramped wild plants. You can find them at Angela Pinaradando and at Domain at Domain Eden Narwhal. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Angela. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, T. Um, thank you so much, AAWW, for hosting this event. And thank you so much to our hardworking ASL interpreters. It's such an honor to be in community with Jen, Jan, Christine, and Kay. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, today. Um, in terms of my visual description, um, I am a uh, queer, non-binary, folk next person. My hair is short and I have longer hair on top that has been dyed blonde. I have a gold septum ring, the shape of a cradled half moon. I'm wearing a shirt the color of burnt orange with very small diamond prints, and I'm sitting in a white room. Okay, um, so as I'm reading, I'll be showing some images of a visual and text collaboration that is in Nature Felt But Never Apprehended. This collaboration is made up of myself and my partner, Claudia torres Ambriz, who is a visual artist that specializes in sculpture and metalsmithing. In this specific collaboration, I revisit Claudia's three-dimensional installation figure by transforming it into an ethereal two-dimensional figure while also combining that image <clears throat> with my poem, Mercy Ceremony, which I will read today. Uh, that will be one of the three poems I read. And um, I will have some of these selected images up as I read these pieces to you. So I'm going to try to share my screen right now. My PowerPoint video, give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> So the first piece that I will be reading is um, informed by geography and uh, and a language of ge geography. And I use um, I'm sorry, geology. And I use um, geology as a way to uh, talk about violence and loss, but also as a way to to um, give myself, allow myself also distance from very uh, sensitive and intense subject matter. And it's titled, Exigencies in Layers One. Sediment. 
Attacker, interrogator, ungrateful and exorbitant, you do not end with age. Sediment, to vanquish one's crucial identity. Partial liquefaction. Tell me what it means to view this body outside of a fetishized object or extinction. Sedimentary rock, mattresses split in two. Shale, when your body is not yours to own, concrete and finite without guidance from the sun. Sedimentary conglomerate, you are farther from me now, even when I flee or fight off flashes. You simply desire me arrive. Brickia, love us in our deviancy, fossil of hope. Okay, the Next piece that I am going to read is um, a, a poem inspired and informed by uh, the film Markova Comfort Gay. And it was a Filipino produced film done in 2001 or around the early 2000s about a Filipino drag queen who performed and also was a comfort person, similar to comfort women uh, to the Japanese during the Japanese occupation in the Philippines during World War II. And as you can see from the background, I'm also sort of changing the images slightly here. So this poem is titled, Letter to Streets That Burned You. Dear ungiven name, one who has been heard, if tied by rope, if paired with glass, if adorned in tectite. Dear sunburst of whipped black wigs, emerald sari starlets at the Subaki nightclub on the corner of Mabini Street. Dear Manila at dawn, ask the soldiers why they imprison them in barracks now the resolved sports complex. Dear golden gaze of Pasai, you know what's God like, sugarcane field dandies, bitter melon buckla, queens in violent eye shadows. Dear bar girl in a fish tank, nipple fringes rage to swaying osanas. Pinwheel earrings shine as still empty hands cup. Dear Minerva, Carmen, and Sophie, they cut grass on their knees, gatherers of their own hair, applaud their fun bodies, anoint them where they lay. Dear black market healer, even blindfolded, you're much more than others realize. Fingers clasping shape of infinity, but someone made you believe mouths the limit. So my third and final poem is uh, also what inspired these images. And this poem pays homage to the act of ritual, to the act of ceremony. And I also want to wanted to create a space or an imaginary space where I could actually reflect and also face and confront um, uh, histories of colonization, um, internalized uh, isms, and what it might be like to personify them and shed them and cast them off. And this last piece is titled Mercy Ceremony. I am slaying you in my dreams. No slaying you for reals this time. Steel pointed 
aim like hawk bone at your bare collar. Your eyes tell of those ones privileged limbs, that mouth that consumed everything it could because it believed it could with even knowing the immensity. What was once stripped away from me is no longer an invisible assault buried under bladed tendrils of seaweed, havoc of sea grapes. There's nothing holding me back from carving as one does when whittling wood. This butterfly blade on soft tissue to etch my name on your skin, this name for ocean, its secret wind, this tender gouge, jellyfish, all cinematic, haunting above flaring sea anemone. Black sands of my birth, its unseasonable foam, you rope bound, covered in lava sediment. I set your weight on a raft, just made for your tied up frame. Burn guava leaves above each part stamped in volcanic ash. I hover longer over bandaged eyes, wrinkled genitals, moisten pod now, waiting to return to the undulating underbelly. Blow smoke into your one exposed ear so you can feel my life force one last time, like intentional stars colliding as I push your raft off into what's destined to consume. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you so much, readers with me. And also thank you all for coming. Here we go. All right, that's everyone. I believe I am so happy to introduce our wonderful moderator for tonight, a wonderful friend of everyone's, but especially AWW's. We love seeing K. Um, and yeah, without further ado, our wonderful moderator for this evening is K. Ulandai Barrett, who is a poet essayist, cultural strategist, and A plus napper. They are the winner of the 2022 Foundation for Contemporary Art Cy Twombly Award for Poetry, a winner of the 2022 Next Book Residency with Tin House, and a recipient of a 2020 James Baldwin Fellowship at McDowell. Their second book, More Than Organs, received a 2021 Stonewall Honor Book Award by the American Library Association and is a 2021 Lambda Literary Award finalist. They have been featured at the United Nations, the Lincoln Center, the Hemispheric Institute, Symphony Space, the Ford Foundation, Brooklyn Museum, Princeton, Columbia University, Yale, Manchester Prize, Sesame Street, and more. Welcome, Kay. And I'm so excited to, to usher, have you usher us off into this really exciting conversation. Have fun, everyone. Hey, hey, everyone. Thank you, T. Thank you, T. The honest piece about my bio is that I just like to throw in Sesame Street in there so I can like impress my God kids and my nieces and nephews. Um, friends, people in the chat. So there are mad emojis from people, poem after poem, essay after essay. Can we all in the chat just give all of the readers, Christine, Jan, Jen, um, Angela, obviously, everybody in the place, just some big emojis and props for tonight for these poets and writers. Um, accessibility. Image description. I am a light Filipinx brown, round, queer. I have glasses and short hair. I wear a light bluish sweater. And behind me are white doors, and I have COVID Filipinx Dennis the Menace hair that does not wanna listen to me. Um, basta, we have questions. And friends who are here today, feel free. There's a great Q&A piece, um, dialogue bubbles right to the right of the share screen button. Um, please insert any questions you have for these marvelous writers. 
and I want to honor our time and get into it. So I don't know. I don't know if you know where you are. Uh, we're at Interdisciplinary Poetics, Migration, Earth, and Empire. Um, if you're in the wrong Zoom, welcome. Uh, tonight's event signaled the term interdisciplinary writing. In the description, and so much of that word is, is really loaded with numerous approaches to writing and arts making. I would love to hear from the panelists today. Could you all talk more about your approaches to inter interdisciplinary writing? And um, what interrogations or, or methods do you use? And then follow up. What's the difference of like regular poetry versus na interdisciplinary poetry or prose? And does anybody want to take that question or do you want me to choose the speaker? We can ask somebody, don't be shy. We just heard you read your guts out. I guess I can start. I feel like it's resp the responsible thing for me to do. Um, so you are right, Kay, as far as an interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary writing being such a, a loaded word. There's just so many things that come um, from that. And I just want to also give a shout out to when I first saw Jen Soriano's presentation at a, a conference at Bothell University on interdisciplinary writing. And so in terms of this, I, I do want to say that when it comes to interdisciplinary writing or multidisciplinary writing or transdisciplinary writing, art making practices, you know, I, we are definitely building on and expanding an already existing movement and praxis that has been around for some time, right? This idea of an, an act of working with other um, literary genres and or, um, uh, you know, artistic creative genres out of one's um, emphasis or, you know, of uh, emphasize or focused, um, you know, practice. Um, for me, um, as a writer, as a poet, I am very much influenced by the visual arts, also having studied visual arts formally in the university. So that is something that I incorporate a lot, not just in my writing that's published, but also just in my own creative writing practice or my own subject matter, or when I'm trying to think outside of, you know, um, my research is I think a lot about visual arts and that can mean paintings, the cinema, um, you know, music, what have you. And, um, and also, I believe that many writers and artists are, are, are doing this now. This is something that has been going on. But I think it is important to state when one is working in the realm of interdisciplinarity, because I think it signals to audiences in the world that writers such as us are not writing, obviously, in a vacuum right, that we're also in conversation with other cultural producers and other discussions, you know, uh, out there. And so, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. Jan or Jen, does anybody want to chime in? I mean, like similar to Angela, I mean, I think you know, the visual is so important. I mean, specifically for me, I think I'm always sort of jealous of film and jealous of visual media um, in its sort of immediacy, its urgency, it's sort of um, uh, uh, in the ways that it's sort of maybe even more or differently accessible than the written word, especially when it comes to like poetry, like capital P poetry. Um, but I think an interdisciplinary approach doesn't even have to be one that you are actively choosing. I think it's sort of a, it's sort of an impulse. And I think it's an impulse for queer folks. I think it's an impulse for migrant folks. I think it's an impulse for anyone who wants to resist or 
does resist anything that's kind of normative. Um, and I think an interdisciplinary approach, especially to poetry, is one that doesn't want to simply like mimic the poetry that's come before. And so I think like so much of the work today, especially, has been so much about like kind of pushing at the edge of that um, and kind of seeing what else because we all know there's so much out there there's so much out there beyond the poems we grew up reading or the poems that we were taught in school wherever you went to school so I think that's a big part of it um and yeah I think it's really exciting and I yeah I think it's exciting and I think that it's um I almost think that it's not even something you have to like wait for I think you can start you know like I teach poetry and I think it's something you can like start with on kind of like day one especially in a sort of like and in, in academic settings or more formal settings is starting there is actually a way for, for people who's, who, especially for students who are intimidated by poetry, it's a really great um, sort of access point. Yeah, Jan, and I think, I think to your point, um, when we're thinking about these nonlinear approaches, I feel that memory and reporting is really nonlinear. Uh, with a lot of your work tonight and all the pieces shared, there are a lot of deep threads around nostalgia and reportage, right? Um, in in your writing, can you, can you all talk more about how nostalgia and memory build the writing, this interdisciplinary approach? Um, how do nostalgia and memory work itself into your writing and arts process? I feel like it's very connected to an interdisciplinary or hybrid approach. Um, yeah, and how does that push back against U.S. empire. I think Jan, you had mentioned it just, uh, I think the American conversation is like, you're a writer by yourself in a hut at a rich residency by yourself, solo writing the great American novel. So can you all talk a little bit more about how nostalgia works in your writing? I can jump that one off uh, with first a, a, a response or kind of a piggyback off what Jan had mentioned around interdisciplinary writing being an impulse. Uh, I completely agree. I um, I think that uh, I'm going to try to um, weave in Kay's question. Uh, I think that for me, the nostalgia piece um, has 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 come from almost like a longing to be nostalgic. Because to be nostalgic, you need to have clear memories of something to be nostalgic about. And um, when I write, I actually feel a lot of grief around not being able to reclaim clear memories and clear history. And so the impulse to write, not just in straight prose, but in what people might call poetic prose or lyric prose, uh, which I believe is a form of inter interdisciplinary writing, comes from, um, less of a choice and more of a need to be able to imagine into the gaps that have been uh, willfully imposed <laughs> on our experience. And uh, so I have never found just straight prose to be something that serves my authentic being, <laughs> nor my uh, uh, my desire to write into, as somebody put into the chat, a glorious future. Uh, and so interdisciplinary work, I think absolutely can be an impulse that is maybe instinctively a decolonial impulse. Um, but I think it's also a choice. I think it can be a choice to maintain because interdisciplinary writing doesn't necessarily pay the bills. Um, it, it, so it's inherently anti-capitalist as well. <laughs> and so I do have a nostalgia for not necessarily feudalism, <laughs> um, but I have a nostalgia for days of maybe what I imagine to be some aspects of barangay living pre-capitalism, <laughs> you know, where I do try to, I think, use some of my writing to create uh, maybe a visceral feeling of interconnectedness that's hard to feel in, in our current <laughs> capitalist state of being. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else on panel who haven't spoken I want to chime in? Yeah, I like agree a lot with the sort of like 
the impulse of fragmentation of memory because it's sort of like you're attempting to translate your subjectivity via this like uh like sort of like it's like the set in like it's like the archipelagic memory is like a fragmented memory by way of like it's geo geo geographical makeup and so like thinking about like when we're like remembering it's always fraught with separation and sort of like movement of water too and movement of like bodies and sort of this yeah like when I'm thinking well, like my whole thing with my book was like translation and like translation of English into Tagalog and like stepping into that work of memory of like language acquisition of Tagalog and sort of like being in touch with that language in a way that like has makes me aware of like I, my own complicity in sort of like American English hegemony in the Philippines too. Um, yeah, and just a lot of like, and it's, yeah, I just agree with everyone on, on the stuff. Mm, okay, okay, so we're moving again. We were talking about um, Filipino, Filipino, Pinoy, Pinay, hegemony, hegemony, and introduced actually the barangay, which moves me to this, connecting to this. I think there's a frequent motif in um, the diaspora or in Filipino, Pilipinex, Pinoy, Pinay writing that there's an immediate call to family, right? If there's one thing that I feel that there's a commonality, it's that. To the, to the sincerity of mothers mentioned in both Christine and Jan's pieces, um, from how Jen emphasized auntie and uncle humor as wisdom juxtaposed with colonial violence, and lastly, the, the beauty, the sweet, bittersweet of Angela challenging, um, channel, channeling the range of queer familia brilliance. Can you all talk more about how you see the role as family in your writing? What does the emotional temperature do when you explore family in your work? Because everybody knows I love a sad mama nanai poem that's like my niche. But I don't want to like put us in a trope. So I'll talk about how you all connect, no? Well, I think for me, it's like immediately tied to questions of citizenship. Like I'm given my US citizenship because of my mother and like thinking about that relationship to mother tongue too, where it's like, it gets complicated there because that sense of like belonging in this national language is already like escaped from me and sort of like uh, wasn't nurtured um and thinking about this like I like trying to like like the maternal figure as not someone who is always like the sense of home but the sense of like desire to escape too um and thinking about like the Philippines itself as a place that at times you like want to escape like it's a place of belonging but it's also a place of like I think you can like like dormancy for like the self um yeah and sort of like going against um yeah I'm gonna stop there <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in? Dormancy, ooh, juicy. Um, thank you for saying that, Christine. Um, I really like what you said about um, the relationship between mother and citizenship, and 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 it sounds like family, as as Kay said, is such a it's such fertile it's such fertile uh, subject matter. Um, for me, what I'm thinking about or writing about family, it's a really heightened and sensitive place. It's a really thorny place as well. Uh, so it is a place for, for me in terms of where I can encourage a lot of subversion, where I can in, where I can actually um, play and engage with creative and mental and emotional dismantling. Um, in my creative work, and that's why interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary um, writing 
helps or and it can be an aid what Jan said is also this impulse to want to resist um you know what has been embedded or imprinted uh for me as family on a cultural historical well, we'll just say cultural level and so it's definitely a place where I can uh start to really resist a lot of make it a lot, a lot of heavily normative um structures and ideologies and that's when other things come in like reimagining um queer um hi history connections uh queer and trans familial ancestry um uh, family is also a place where i'm constantly um challenging it's a place where i started to challenge and resist gender performances and expectations. So the, the chapter or the subject of family is definitely a, a space where I like to um, prod, poke, challenge, fight, and resist creatively and also in a really healing way um, when I'm, you know, when I'm thinking about my work. Okay, so we're we're moving from healing um, from what Angela is channeling. And I think part of what makes all of your work so strong, right? Um, we are no strangers to the truth that our communities, whether that be queer or Filipinx, we are embedded in art, like in almost everything we do. Even if you're super conservative, there's music for it in our cultures. Um, I love poetry because in that healing, uh, there is music in poetry. It's really rhythmic, it enchants. And tonight we really witnessed examples of that from Angela's epistolary and ode via letters to the streets that burned you to Jen's brilliant essays on page, um, flanking left to right in this prose block, like of political banter um, to layered imagery charged in condensed blocks by Jan, and then to Christine's playful movement of stanza and sparse space. I think interdisciplinary poetry really is a choreography, right? So could you all discuss for us um, how your writing plays with the sonic? How does your writing in this inter interdisciplinary mode um, mess with, I was about to say F with, but PG-13. Uh, mess with musicality in your work and in that musicality do you have any influences like anybody you're like oh yeah I'm gonna utilize this cadence or or this musical formula for my writing I love this question <laughs> and I'm going to jump in I uh, you know I I feel like I was raised by music speaking of family so um Music in a lot of ways um, is a family inheritance that is, you know, has been more healing than individuals, I would say, <laughs> individuals in, in, in the blood family. So um, I, uh, I, I definitely um, think of words put together to, to melody and rhythm almost at all times. Um, and when I, uh, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm drafting, I think, uh, kind of noodling, <laughs> like, I mean, I was a musician actually before I was a writer. And so, um, when I feel like I'm having trouble getting to the page, I always think first about like, well, what would I do if I was writing a song? Um, so I think about kind of like noodling, which is just, you just play whatever comes to mind um, without a structure and without a form, you just you just go with the words. But then in revision, I think about um, how um, in, in music, there's a lot of virtuosos who are like amazing at the, technically at what they do, but when they try to write a song, <laughs> You're just like, oh man, you should work with a songwriter. <laughs> and so there's, you know, there's there's the craft piece of thinking about um, uh, uh, what is the purpose of all of this beautiful, you know, meter and rhythm and rhyme. Um, where 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 am I going with this? With the concepts and themes. Um, and then overall in a book length work, I um, like with nervous. I was really thinking about. Um, 
an album and trying to um, make sure that there was different kind of tones and rhythms and, and emotional kind of feels and beats to, to each, to each essay. Um, so I, uh, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> I think about it a lot. Um, and, um, and I think it is actually another way that I think of, of my work as interdisciplinary because I, I think of it as musical as well. Um, I hope readers experience it that way. Uh, and uh, one of my one of my recent influences around this has been Janelle Monet, and just like looking at, I think listening to a lot of the ways that 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 she just she experiments and plays with all kinds of different things without giving a, an F about genre of music. Beautiful. And just to note, I just bought Janelle Monet's vinyl. I'm eagerly awaiting it in the mail. So. Jen, I see you. Who else wants to talk about the musicality? Yeah, I I want to just jump in. Well, I agree with Jen. I love this question. And Kay, you do such a good job at like kind of like weaving these questions. I'm just like, just a quick clap clap for Kay's ability to ask brilliant questions, but also to weave them so naturally. So there's that. Oh, the thing about music is, or musicality, especially in writing, is often... I think it's 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 um, for a really long time. I thought the easy answer was that it's something I sort of pick up on the shelf or from the shelf during revision, um, and I think that was true for a really long time. I think now that I am like writing more and sort of thinking about it in different ways, I actually think like musicality can only go so far as your ability to like listen. And I, I really love, like we can talk about like music and musics um, and some of the sort of more sonic qualities and poetry, but I love listening to how people speak. And I love listening to their weird pauses when and when people um, <laughs> um, the things, the sort of patterns of speech that people have. And I think there's something really special and unique and like so individual about the sort of human rhythms people have like in their um, speaking and sort of like general bodily noise making. <laughs> um, and I think it's really exciting to try to um, impart that or even stamp that into your writing. It's really hard to do. Like it's so easy to say, find your voice, but it's like, what does that mean? And like, what does my voice sound like? what do my sentences, what do my lines sound like? And I, so I think when I think of musicality, especially now I'm thinking of musicality as something that is um, sort of like on your, it's like, it's, 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 it's on your, it's, it's how your mouth moves. It's, it's the word, it's, so, you know, there are words that you say and words that you don't. Um, and there's some words that trip you up. And I love, at least for myself, one of my kind of rules is, don't put a word in a poem that you can't pronounce or or at least can't say in a delicious way. <laughs> um, and so I, when I think of musicality now, I really am thinking of it as a, a way of getting closer to yourself. Um, and maybe that sounds sort of like masturbatory or something, but like in a way of sort of like becoming more intimate with like your own sound. Um, so like, it's like finding your voice, but it's also like finding your music. Um, yeah. I love that everybody go find their own music. That's what I'm just gonna say to me. I'm gonna be that good beat. That was beautiful, Jen. Um, so just letting you all know as far as accessibility, I have two more questions and then we're gonna open up. We're gonna try to wrap up at about, we have apparently till nine, but I wanna honor people's time and probably go till about 8.30, 8.35. So, um, because we've mentioned music and because we've mentioned some of our influences, can you all talk about who's sparking excitement? Um, who's on your radar? What new creative projects besides your own, of course, um, are really like making you giddy or making you like, oh, there's hope in this turbulent empire. Um, is there anybody that we should get into or bookmark for ourselves as artists and for the audience? I mean, I have several recommendations, but 
somebody else can, can I, I, share. Guess, I guess there. Uh, so, okay, who, who here knows Janice Lee's work? Yes, okay, so well, for other folks who might not know Janice Lee's work, I am I'm going to shout out Janice Lee work. <laughs> I have been actually looking at Janice Lee's essays. I actually have their essay book right here. Um, the sky isn't blue. Together with um, uh, her novel and also um, the latest book of poetry that came out, Separation Anxiety. And just, um, I just rolling around and just, uh, really appreciating the richness of the it, what would be a combination of, of poetry and pose poetry and prose po, po, poet that poet rose <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is happening in these works um and the ways that you know that deep subjects are covered in 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 with with pretty glorious beauty so that's who's on my reading list right now. Anyone else? Okay, I will go. I will not fight you off. First is um, Miss Major. Conversations with a Black Trans Revolutionary Speaks. It's written by a queer Asian, actually, Toshio Maronek. It was really prevalent in the Bay. Um, just, I just need to learn more about queer movement before 1990, you know, <laughs> come on. And then Basta, a new one that's out is a more academic book and it's uh, by a poet, an Arab queer femme, Palestinian poet, pre-Palestine, between Banat, a uh, queer Arab critique in transnational Arab archives by Mejdaline Shomali. And then I'm really messing with um, Freedom House by KB Brookins, Black Trans in Texas right now. The, the structures are really beautiful. Um, it goes from really succinct prose blocks to like the physical space of a house and also um, really messing with like forms as far as like resumes and CVs as a trans and Black person. So um, those are my current three. And uh, Golden's A Dead Name That Learned to Live. That was a Lambda finalist in trans poetry. The, none of these people are very um, linear. So I always love to read um, essayists I like are Pamela Sneed, who is a poet and a theater artist and an essayist. I just like people who could do all the shit at once. This is why we're all here. Thanks so much for that, Kay and Jen. Um, I'm always amazed when I'm when I can have time and space to read any kind of um, science fiction or dystopian or um, fantasy uh, like novel book or or hybrid inspired you know lit. Um, it just it's it's a, it's really comforting for me. It also just um, it's extremely comforting and just it's so it's always so prolific and so visionary. They're like writers who write in the genre are always, I feel like telling us in some way the future. And um, a book that I just finished while being on residency was actually an older novel called, um, it's, it sounds like New Orleans, but without the new, so it's just Orleans. And it is a set actually in 2026, which is weird. Um, but it was written in the, I think in the late nineties or early two thousands, but it's set in the 2026, not too far from where we are right now. And it's during a, a, a pandemic, <laughs> which is crazy. And, um, but the, but the South is specifically affected, specifically um, the New Orleans area and, and uh, an area around New Orleans. And the writer is a, a Black writer who is, who has, family from the South, from New Orleans, but the way that she talks about um, um, like uh, the environment, the natural environment um, playing a huge role in uh, a dystopian, uh, like a dystopian like landscape and setting, I think is really beautiful. And I just think like the imagination and the planning and the research that goes into 
this, these kind of dystopian settings, again, they're just so inspiring, but also they're, they like cradle my very, um, sensitive, rebellious, um, at times like pessimistic heart. And, um, it, it's just, it gives me a place where I can kind of dream and put myself in these, in even hyper dystopian settings and, and think about survival in um, really creative ways, especially authors of color who are writing about this. And, you know, we have this protagonist that is, you know, uh, like a protagonist person of color or a femme identified person of color. Like those are things I'm really excited about when I do get my hands on them. So Angela, this brings us to um, connected to dystopia. <laughs> Awkward face. Uh, my last question. Uh, finally, given to the current tumultuous political context of the pandemic, of dystopia, um, I was, uh, I'm in the East Coast, and so the Canadian wildfires really brought that yellow haze motif that I was not interested in, you know, um, when we're talking about climate catastrophe. So if we think about that context, as well as both and not, uh, the beautiful union and organizing efforts locally and globally. So for arts, uh, I would point to exactly T's efforts and AAWW Union to Harper Collins um, as multimedia and interdisciplinary writers and poets. What do you hope for the future? What do you hope for interdisciplinary writing? Um, and what do you want to see it do? What do you want to um, experience more of? And after this question, we will open it up to the crowd. I love that I asked a question that stumps you all, that's all. Your questions are so good. I, I think, you know, one thing I would wanna see is, um, I think just more, um, more support for it. <laughs> so I'm going to be real concrete about that more money. <laughs> um, so for example, here in Seattle, we have um, a museum called the Fry Museum that, um, that gives money to writers to do visual art exhibits based on their writing. Uh, and I, it's one of my favorite art based things that happens in Seattle. Um, so I, I would actually love, because we still live in a capitalist society and we need to survive, <laughs> I would really love to see arts funders and um, institutions, uh, foundations, private donors um, contribute to opportunities for, for artists to do more interdisciplinary work. So writers to do more of it themselves, writers to collaborate, um, with others, with visual artists, dancers, like, you know, filmmakers, <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, and for, for, um, all of us to be able to, um, yes, <laughs> glucose guardians, <laughs> I love that, um, and to, you know, to be able to do more of it and to thrive. Beautiful point, beautiful point. Anyone else? Uh, to, uh, just to echo and piggyback on what Jen said, um, on on also like an on the you know educational institutional level, I think it would be great if um, schools, colleges, universities were more open um, and also supportive, also on the financial end as well, but definitely much more open in terms of what how like various departments are in conversation with each other, how they can collaborate with each other, like what can happen in public schools in terms of what um, what students are reading um, and, and how they're reading them and also how they're engaging with their reading. Because I feel that uh, stories, poems, whatever novels can at times stay in, in, a, in a specific category when being taught. And I, I'm a big supporter of 
um, you know, exposing and teaching students about the expansiveness of literacy when they're young and the possibilities of that. And that's something I think that would, I, I hope would also benefit all the writers who are writing in this form and who are openly, or who are open about writing in this form. Let's wrap up with Jan, give it to us. Yeah, I mean, so many things to say in a way, but like, um, in short, it's part of like working um, interdisciplinarily, it's a big word, is sort of sending the message that like, we're not done. Like we're not done making, we're not done defining, we're not done um, making art making writing. And so, I mean, if you were to try to define interdisciplinarity to like a eight-year-old, you might feel challenged, but really it's like, we, they already work that way. The internet art is already multidisciplinary, but no one thinks of it that way. It's just, you. it's a kind of like you wake up and you're already multimodal. It's like, you're already doing these things sort of like from the jump. And so in a way, sometimes I think we outsmart ourselves by creating these, these, these titles or these genre distinctions. Um, and I think like to the point, I think I both, I mean, Jen and Angela, Angela both made it of sort of like thinking about it institutionally, whether that's like funding or resources, but like still, I think it's, 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 it has to be questioned like why, for example, so many MFA programs are, you have to choose fiction or poetry, or maybe if you're lucky, there's a third genre, but it's like, why three? Why genre, you know, it's like, why genres in the first place? Um, so I think there's this, there's this thing of uh, maybe not even um, like, yeah, yeah, sort of a not, not, not outsmarting ourselves and maybe not even thinking of it as a precious sort of, oh, I'm gonna do this risky thing and present visual work while I read. I remember, and this was many years ago, seeing Jennifer S. Chang read her poems while showing um, visual work that she had made behind her. And it was sort of this thing that she didn't have to over explain. There was something really beautiful about it because it's like, oh yeah, you don't have to explain that you're showing images of nature for your like deeply naturalistic and deeply like migratory and deeply thoughtful like poems. Um, I don't know. So I guess, I, I don't even know what I'm saying, except that it's sort of, um, um, yeah, there should be more of it. And I think that you know, like tonight's a really great example of there's so many ways to think that in this way and to make in this way. Beautiful, beautiful, Jen. Thank you for letting us expand um, how we think and where we are. I want to just open up a good 10 minutes committed because we want to also honor the ASL interpreter's time. It's a hard stop before 840. Um, and pull from the questions in chat from the crowd. And I'm going to read those questions. And if we could get just two panelists per question, just so we know that we're at a tight stop. I would love that. Um, one question was, quote, you all write from your own socio-historical perspective. How do you deal with the pain of knowing and then transform that into your works? How does the painful past become our glorious future? Friends, I don't know the answer to this. Who wants to take this on? So what I'm hearing is pain and knowing how to move forward. Well, since that is um, a lot of what I wrestled with for the past eight years in writing my book, uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think that, um, first of all, facing the pain on our own terms is a first step because for me personally, um, when I was not able to face the pain, both I'm talking about pain that was actually physically in my body, um, and then the embodied pain of the pain in our histories, um, I uh, was not able to think about the future. <laughs> I couldn't even barely get through the present. I was never present even. Um, so I think you know the actual processing of pain through through writing. Um, is a first step to then being able to touch into uh, the other feelings that can come with, with envisioning a different future. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'll leave it there.
anyone else want to take that on before the next question? You know, no, no uh, pressure. Just wrap up pain and moving forward in like two minutes. That was sarcasm. I, I think that like looking at like these painful histories and memories, it's also like, I think what helps is like writing through like, uh, like histories of survival as well because that allows like I think that like looking back as a way to like move forward too and, and seeing these sort of like like uh or like what Sadia Hartman says in Venus in Two Acts it's like imagining what cannot be verified and sort of but while while doing that also like respecting the imperative of the black noise of like of of slaves and not just like being not like imagining a happy ending without like thinking about like the actual material conditions because I think when we think about those material conditions it's also like um I think that allows us to think beyond the poem um and yeah I think that's how I'm like thinking about it I don't know um yeah um there's a beautiful essay by Kieran Kahn and it's about like the little things, the little details of what keeps you alive. Like it's like a nice haircut, looking at flowers, like little things. So I think that's what I would have to say to that. But I wanna touch on a question that I think is actually super important. And I don't know if the literary discusses it even in Asian Pacific Island or Southeast Asian, South Asian circles. And I would love for this um, to be uplifted by Angela and Jan actually. Uh, someone wrote, thank you all for being here and sharing, three exclamation points. This is the first Philippinex literary space. And as an aspiring Philippinex poet, this is so, so, so special to me. Heart. My question is, how did you find the spaces that encouraged your writing? And in what ways do you move through creative blocks when so much of the process can unearth complicated histories, trauma, et cetera? How did you all find your writing homes? I mean, in some ways, I, I don't know, aren't we all still looking for those homes and to have multiple and many and have them in every city and have them in every space and have like multiple readers and audiences and communities? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for this one. And I think it's it's a lovely question. And I love that you're here. And I love that you're kind of coming into contact with it in this way. I didn't come into contact with anything like this early on and for many, many years. I didn't even think it was possible. Um, um, you know, in some ways, uh, something like Kundiman is an amazing example of um, writing with community, but by no means is it the only sort of stop on the journey. Um, I think that it's sort of about being a little stubborn and maybe even a little, um, you know, like to advocate for yourself and just sort of, you know, create your own spaces and and sort of um, show up when you can, um, depending on where your sort of geographic community is, your literary communities uh, are. I just know that it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not always easy to find. I'm sort of imagining like, a queer person asking a similar question maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It's like, where do I find queer community in my small town? There might not be one. Um, and even, even though we have the internet, even though we have these different ways of accessing other people and other communities, um, hopefully you can, at, the, at I don't know, find it on the page at the very least, find it on, uh, find it on screens, um, watch, watch movies, read books, talk to people, bring it up, like bring it up. <laughs> Like ask ask your English teacher in high school why there aren't any Filipino authors this year. Um, I never thought of even asking that question um, going to school here. Um, so I think sort of um, yeah, making me maybe making your own presence be known. I mean, uh, this is why I think the question is so great. Is you ask the question and and in the question is as an aspiring writer, it's like thank you for telling us that and thank you for like saying that out loud. And we look forward to reading your work and hearing it out there. Angela, what are your thoughts on this question? 
Um, I think what Jan said, oh my God, I think Jan said so many important, valuable things that I can relate to um, that I think many of us in this panel, many folks that are out there that can relate to um, with everything. There isn't just one space, there are multiple spaces out there, but there's also this presence that also can feel really isolating depending where you are physically, depending where you are you know, I don't know, uh, mentally or emotionally, and, um, but what it means to also challenge those spaces, like what Jan said, asking, you know, your teacher, your mentor, your friends, where are they, where are the Filipinx or Filipino American or Filipino, who, whatever queer trans Filipinx writers, where are they, and why are they in our syllabus, or our spaces, or our classroom, or can we find them together, you know, or maybe, are there other Asian writers that we can fight together and that always opens up to more, right? I always think about like one door or one window opens into another space. And sometimes that has doors and windows there that open into another space. And a lot of these are unexpected. So I think being open to the unexpected um, and just being open in general. Um, I mean, you're here. So you being here also, will probably open other portals to other resources. And, and again, I want to say that I can completely relate with Jan. Um, when, when I started, whatever that was, like it, it, it uh, well, I did the quote thing. I know that's not in style, whatever. Um, that, um, yeah, I felt like there wasn't anyone that I could relate to, um, that I felt that I was in the communities that I have now. So it took a lot of time, but the thing is it, 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 it did happen and it continues to happen. It happens in waves, right? Sometimes you're on a high and sometimes it feels really low, but um, I think now it's much easier in terms of virtually and online to connect. But um, I think there's also this, that you have to believe, like you have to believe that you you can and will connect and there are other people out there. I think it starts from there. And I think it's also about like how these spaces or spaces that nourish you help you come back really to yourself, you know, and, mm. and what that might mean. So, but that's a wonderful question. So very, really difficult too, but thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. I would just like to say I was too trans for Asian circles. I was too disabled for abled circles. Um, so I found trans or organizing or theater spaces and then became connected to those writers. So sometimes it's not the most obvious. Just, you know, sometimes you find home in the strangest of places. And lastly, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Let's give a round of applause online to Jan, Christine, Jen, Angela, to T for doing all the coordination, to Pro Bono for constant communication with us. Um, I know I didn't field everyone's questions that is on me, my deepest apologies. Please reach out to us as writers, seek our social media, our Instagram to build these conversations. And next week, um, speaking of queer Asians, uh, we have a pride celebration uh, featuring Chrysanthemum Tran, Diamond Ford, and Rika Aoki. So please come and join us. I we'll hand it over to the magnificent, unionizing, power strong T. Thank you so much, Kay. What a wonderful <laughs> little introduction to me. No, I don't really introduce Jesus me. I introduce everyone else. Thank you. Um, thank you to our readers and Kay for moderating such a wonderful conversation. I just thought what we ended it on was so, special and important to say every time. I feel like we have a lot of those conversations about spaces and finding spaces, but it's a very important to have those in conversations every time they come up. Um, please join me in applauding and thanking our dear ASL interpreters, Ingrid and Gregorio. We're always so honored to work with Pro Bono ASL to provide ASL accessibility to AEWW virtual events. To our audience, thank you for being here. I have put in the chat links to everyone's books. Please order their books. There are many publications from all of our writers here. Um, and then also uh, we have, yeah, like, 
Kay said, we have an event. And if you scroll up in the uh, chat a little bit, next Thursday, a week from today, we have our virtual Pride event and you can RSVP for that. And we'll see you there. All right. Thank you, everyone.